I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are... It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! Welcome back to our next episode of It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. On today's episode, we are going to have an interview with Susan Elia McNeil, who writes the Maggie Hope Mystery Series. But before we get started, we wanted to take this opportunity to wish everyone a wonderful and safe 4th of July. Happy 4th of July, everyone. Yesterday, our July newsletter just hit the presses, I guess you would say. The newsletter just went out. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, please go to our website at itwasadarkandstormybookclub.com and sign up there, and you will get some interesting articles, a lineup of who's coming up on the episodes for a particular month, whatever little tidbits that we can add in. It's special stuff that may not be on our episodes. We do review some books and highlight some books. So check out our newsletter. And a new feature we have is some of our authors that have appeared on our show writing articles for the newsletter. Definitely give that a look-see. They're very interesting. And while you're there signing up for the newsletter, very close to that newsletter sign up is our Patreon button. You can join our other patrons, take advantage of our reward tiers, and also they get direct access to us on our Patreon page. You might want to give that some consideration. Now, on with the show. Susan Ilya McNeil is the New York Times bestselling author of the Maggie Hope Mysteries. McNeil won the Barry Award and has been nominated for the Edgar McCavity Agatha, Left Coast Crime, Dillies, and ITW Thriller Awards. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her husband and son. Her book, Prisoner of the Castle, came out last year in hardcover, and it will be out in paperback at the end of July. It is about an American-born spy and codebreaker extraordinaire, Maggie Hope must solve a baffling series of murders among a group of captive agents on an isolated Scottish island as the acclaimed World War II mystery series continues. Maggie Hope is being held prisoner on a remote Scottish island with other SOE agents who know too much for the enemy's comfort. All the spies on the island are trained to kill, and when they start dropping off one by one, Maggie needs to find the murderer before she becomes the next victim. We are thrilled to welcome Susan Elia McNeil to our podcast. She is the author of the wonderful Maggie Hope Mystery Series. Welcome, Susan. Thank you so much. You're, you're making me blush. We have been huge fans of Maggie Hope ever since Mr. Churchill's secretary. How did Maggie come to be, and how did you develop such a great character? Maggie sprang out of nowhere, and I have to thank the Jim Henson Muppets, actually, as crazy as that sounds. I was a writer and magazine editor in New York City, and I was writing about 20-something women in present-day New York City, which is what I was at the time. My husband, who worked as a puppeteer for the Jim Henson Company, got the role of Bear in Bear in the Big Blue House, which aired on Disney Channel. It was really, really popular in the UK. And so we went one summer, I think it was in 1999, to London. We spent two months there. So we were there and a friend of ours very kindly brought me a copy of Time Out London. Our friend James turned to a page where there's a tiny little ad for the cabinet war rooms. They weren't the Churchill war rooms then. It wasn't as popular as it is now. And he said, you know, despite what you Yanks might think, World War II didn't begin with Pearl Harbor. You might want to check out this museum. So I took it as a challenge, and the next day I went to the museum, and it was an experience that really transformed my life. Well, I can understand that, and we actually have a connection to Churchill. Really? He is my 10th cousin, twice removed in our family tree. My grandmother was a Churchill. That is very impressive. Yes. (laughs) So we're very interested. If I ever get over there, I'm definitely going to go check that out. 
Absolutely. I was over there and I didn't get there, but I'm going to do it next time we come. We now know why you chose World War II. So why did you choose mystery as your genre? It's funny you should ask that because I actually wrote an entire novel about Maggie Hope that was not a mystery. And it was more literary and it was more about civilian life in London during the Blitz and death and coming of age things. And it went out to all sorts of agents and everyone came back with, you know, we really love this. We love the characters, but it's just very quiet. Like nothing really happens. And so I thought, well, I could certainly change that. And that's when the mystery came in. And I remember reading quite literally about the technique about like the ticking clock. And I thought, well, let's have a ticking bomb. That'll be really suspenseful. That's kind of how the structure came about. So you kind of stumbled into it. (laughs) I kind of came in through a side door. Yeah, well, we're so happy you did because I would have almost swore you set out to do this. They are very brilliantly done. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I did work on it for a long, long time. So this was no overnight success. I worked on that book for, I think, 10 years before it was published. Yeah, in various editions. We just love how you have aligned Maggie with real historical characters such as Churchill, Princess Elizabeth, Eleanor Roosevelt, and others. How did you research these historical people and fit them into your fictional characters so seamlessly? Thank you. First of all, I think one of the best things you can do when you're researching is to look up accounts that are from the first person. So Eleanor Roosevelt's newspaper columns, Churchill's speeches, anything that comes from the person in their own words. That's like one of the best resources that you have to work with. So I always tried to look for that and to look at film clips of them on documentaries, that kind of thing. In addition to other research, obviously I read lots of biographies. You find like that tiny bit of character in the first person accounts. Well, luckily they're historical, but they're not too far back. So there's quite a bit about each one of them. And in fact, I'd like to just say a thank you to a friend who was a Blitz survivor. She was 10 in 1940, and she lived in London, and she reads my books and just makes sure that my details are accurate. So I have to say thank you. My husband was one of the children that was evacuated with name tags on them. He was sent to Wales. Yes. Her parents wanted to keep the family together, which is why she stayed in London. Which book was the easiest to write and which was the hardest? You know, that's like asking a mom what was her easiest labor and delivery. I don't think any book is ever easy. I really enjoyed researching His Majesty's Hope. I loved going to Berlin. I loved going back to London. I was just so thrilled that the series was continuing. I was just so excited about that. That was one of the books I really had the most fun with. And then the hardest one was Mrs. Roosevelt's Confidant. And that was because my mother-in-law became very ill. It was just a very hard time. I was taking care of a young child. My husband was working. I was taking care of an older person, also trying to write. That was one of the hardest writing experiences I've had. One of the things that we absolutely love about the Maggie Hope series is the complexity of the characters she comes in contact with in her life. She has friends that end up in bad places and then a very difficult history with her being abandoned by her parents and then her mother's alliance with the Nazi party. Why did you feel Maggie should have such a difficult history? In an ideal world, all of my characters, because I love them, I I truly, truly love them so much. They would all sit around and have tea and discuss fonts or flowers or something wonderful and calm and joyful. But that isn't really what a book is about. So you have to put your characters in all these awful, horrible situations and really kind of torture them. So Maggie really needed, I felt as a character to come up against not just like the Nazis as the sort of the enemy of England, but, you know, have it be quite personal. And it is personal in your books. <laughs> you feel for her. Good, yes. Her relationship with her mother and her father sort of play through the books. The one that I'm working on now actually returns to the character of her mother, Clara Hess. And it was really, really fun to write. We do see these characters. Sometimes it maybe takes a book or more to like come back to them, but they do come back. Well, I think Clara's a fun character anyway. She's kind of evil and kind of sneaky. Absolutely. <laughs> you did a good job with her. Thank you. 
Maggie Hope herself is evolving through this series. She's become an autonomous, smart woman. In the current political climate, is this more important than ever to portray strong, independent women? That is such a good question. I think there have always been smart, independent women like throughout history. I think it's important to tell their stories. And Maggie is, of course, fictional, but there were so many women who, during World War II, worked to break codes and were parachuted behind enemy lines to spy and sabotage. And I think it's important for us to know their stories. And I think in terms of being a woman today, looking back and seeing so many strong women and what they did to protect democracy is so important. That's very true. What were the biggest hurdles you had to overcome when writing historical fiction? Ooh, well, one of the first was that it's not of your time period, obviously. So there's so much research that you have to do. And then for me, there was a double bind in that it wasn't my country. Most of the books take place in the UK, if not Germany or, well, there was Washington. But one of the ways to overcome that is, of course, doing the research. And I always love talking to people who were alive during that period, and, you know, who want to share their memories and what it was really like. And you do get a sense of what it was really like, not just in the books, but in real life. One of the things that has come up with people saying women didn't swear, for example, during the 40s. And here's the thing. If you talk to women who lived, who were, you know, teenagers or in their 20s during the 40s, they did not swear in public. That's it. <laughs> in private, they would swear and drink and smoke and sprawl and sit in all kinds of crazy contortions because they were in private. So there's a big difference between public life and private life. And I think we all think about the past. It's filtered through movies and books and newsreels where it's all public. So when you get to talk to people, that's when you start to really feel like what things might have been like in private. And that's what I try to show in the books is that these women have a public persona, but then they also have these private personae. We get to know them in a different way than if you just turn on an old movie from the 40s. That is so true. I used to talk to my grandmother and ask her questions, and it was almost a little shocking to hear some of the things that they did back then, because oh. you have a perception of seeing these movies that everything was so glamorous. I think it's true of us today. We have a different public persona than we do at home. Oh, yeah, obviously. Now we're used to people do use profanity a lot more, and I just remember that was one of the criticisms, like, oh, she would never say, you know, the D word, which is damn. And it was like, well, yes, she would have when she was thinking to herself or talking with her female friends. Yes, she would have. <laughs> yeah, but she wouldn't have. You would never have said that in front of Mr. Churchill or at work or anywhere in public. Of course not. You couldn't wear pants and you, you had to wear gloves and a hat and when you went out. And <laughs> stockings with the same straight. Now, did your work as an assistant for John Irving influence your writing in any way? Well, I think what was really amazing about that opportunity was I got to work with a professional novelist at the sort of peak of his success. The really great thing about that is that he treated writing like a job. And I got to see someone sort of get up, get coffee, go to the office, which was in his incredibly beautiful Vermont home, and spend the entire day working. That set like an incredible precedent for me in terms of just how to be a professional writer and how to take it seriously. That's great. Was there a real Hillock Castle that served as a prison for people who knew too much? There really was. It wasn't a oh. castle, but there was a manor house in Scotland. The SOE agents who knew too much or who had failed out in some way were kept there. And they were kept there under very lovely conditions. They had really good food and they had billiards tables and tennis courts and all these kinds of things, but they were not allowed to leave. That's absolutely real. And then the castle part came from me. I visited the Isle of Rum, which is off the west coast of Scotland near Arisaig, where all of these secret agent training camps were. It was just the most horrific Victorian monstrosity I've ever seen. The stories about the industrialist who built the castle during the Victorian times were so awful that I just knew I had to use that. So I sort of combined two things. 
Well, what I found interesting in reading Prisoner in the Castle was that the servants looked down on the prisoners because they assumed they were like shirking their responsibilities. Was that drawn from truth or did you kind of make that up? I made that up, although I would think that because the servants didn't really know why those people were being imprisoned and they were treated so much better, like they had better food and they were just sort of 